Hello. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Jason Levine, Principal Worldwide Evangelist for Adobe. And today, this is now part two of our How to Make Good Videos Great with Audio series, three-part series. And uh, this week, we're going to focus on audio workflows in Audition. Now, again, this is specific or sort of targeted towards audio for video, but really all the techniques and things that I'll talk about today you can use in any kind of audio mixing. Let's go ahead and start. Here we are in Audition, and uh, we're going to be working on for at least the first couple of, uh, probably the first half hour or so, on this edit here. Now, I've actually used this edit in another one of my projects, uh, which I recently uploaded as a, as a video to YouTube, how to use AutoDuck and Auto uh, AutoGate, which we're going to cover here today. Um, this is uh, an interview with one of my oft collaborators, an incredible musician, and songwriter, this guy up there named Fuzzy Island, and you can find, again, some of our music on my YouTube channel, and a forthcoming album coming to Spotify very, very soon. You'll also notice, of course, here that we've got some time code now inside, displayed inside Audition, uh, Audition's video panel, added a couple of new time code overlay, and just additional sort of video preference options here in Audition. You've got full screen options. You can mirror your full screen and determine resolutions. You can, of course, send out separate, uh, the actually send out that video panel directly via HDMI. Um, and it's also just nice to finally have the time code where you now also have the option in this latest update, CC 2018, to reference session or media time codes. So what I want to start doing is first we're going to talk a little bit about using the new dynamics or the reimagined dynamics effect in Premiere Pro and Audition largely leveraging the auto gate function just to kind of gate out or eliminate some of the background noise not that it was uh, uh bad noise but just to really quiet the sections in between his talking bits now you can see that we've got the dialogue cut up here uh into different sections pretty nicely but let's take a quick listen to this um as it is unmixed uh with some music underneath it and this is also going to allow us to leverage the uh, auto ducking, uh, so yes, auto ducking feature as part of essential sound here in Audition. So take a quick listen to this. Here we go. Three, four. My name is Fuzzy Island, and uh, I play music, or write music, or write stories, tell stories. Uh, I guess I'm just a storyteller, guitar player, singer, songwriter. I'm so down. One more she little section well, here. I think it's very cool. The one thing I miss about my younger days when I was living in Tennessee. Okay. So, um, as you can hear, it's nice, it's fine, it's whatever, it's unmixed. Um, we've just dropped the music about 13 dB or so, as you can see here. And where I like to sort of begin with this, and by the way, because this was sent directly from Premiere, it's got all of my same color-coded tracks all of the track names and, of course, all the fader positions and everything that I've done also translate through here. Um, and any effects that were added also appear non-destructively. So if I were in Premiere and I wanted to sort of start manipulating the audio to make things better, you know, what would I do? Well, first, I'd probably use some of the volume envelopes that you see here. And, you know, you start keyframing in to bring the music down and the dialogue up or however you normally do that, right? So that's what auto ducking is going to solve for us automatically. The other thing is that talked a lot about or a little bit about room tone last week. What I wanted to showcase here is where we've got some nice clean dialogue with a nice sounding room tone. Um, but again, in between his talking sections, I just kind of wanted to silence that out. Uh, you can always put room tone back in, but we're going to have some cutaways where we don't really. I just wanted to kind of eliminate some of that in between speech background noise. And for that, we're going to use the auto gate function inside of the dynamics filter. Okay. So uh, I think I'll put on my headphones here so I can hear this a little bit better. So let's go ahead and solo the dialogue first and take a listen. And perhaps we'll stay in this clip here where he's doing some pausing and just a bit more critically listen to what's actually going on. I'm going to mute the background sound here. And uh, let's take a listen to what Fuzzy has to say and be sort of pay attention. I'm going to actually boost this up a little bit. Pay attention to any kind of room tone and background sound. Here we go. You cared about and uh, the site sort of does that. It's I to be honest, it's not the same as sitting on a porch with old friends and playing, but it's close. 
It's like the technological version of that. Okay. So you can hear there's just some very standard common room tone. By the way, worth pointing out that this dialogue was captured uh, with an iPhone, which I talk about a lot using that as my um, sort of as an audio source for secondary audio, particularly for interviews and things. It's clean. It's nice. It'll capture just very easily. It's just the default voice recorder app, and I've used it countless times. Okay, so one of the first things I'm I'm wanting to do uh, is, again, to use that auto gate just to kind of gate out some of that background noise when he stops talking. I want to keep the gate open when he's kind of pausing, thinking, to keep that room tone there, but we'll set the threshold, remember the point at which the gate kind of kicks in or out, accordingly so that it really just lets his voice come through. And then when he stops talking, it closes that gate, or as I often say, kind of shuts that window. So let's go ahead and wind back. And what you'll see is on the track here, I've actually got dynamics already enabled. So if I double click this inside of our effects rack here, this is the same rack effect that we showcased last week in Premiere Pro. And again, why I love this Dynamics effect, not only because it's been reimagined in the 2018 release, is that it has really, uh, you know, all the sort of basic things that you need to, um, again, gate noise in between spoken passages, um, compress a voice if you need to kind of even out some of those dynamics, downward expand, again, similar to using an auto gate, but also to kind of manipulate sort of dynamic control, and then your limiter here. Um, me, I primarily use this effect for the auto gate just because it's fast and effective and it gets right to it. So what we want to do is we're going to listen to this and then we're simply going to adjust the threshold. And we've got some nice metering here and I'll, I'll talk more about what this is doing once we see it. And effectively, we're just going to adjust that threshold so that again, when he starts talking, it passes through, it allows the gate to open so we can hear what he's saying. And then when he stops talking, it closes. Now you've got basically three additional settings here. The attack time is how quickly it kicks in. And for most dialogue, generally you want this pretty fast, okay? If your attack time is too slow, you might miss the beginnings of some consonants and things, particularly if you know people are not speaking or enunciating um, where there's going to be some kind of big, you know, well, you know, if you were to see the waveform, you'd see kind of that, boom, right, that little transient. So attack should be fairly quick pretty much all the time. Um, what is the actual minimum here? Oh, yeah, it actually goes to like, you know, 0 0.1 milliseconds. Generally, one millisecond will do it. Here's a tip. If you are cutting off the speech, um, again, adjust your threshold first. Make sure that it's going into the green and you'll see what I'm talking about. But if it's still not catching the beginning of your phrases, just drop that attack time and you can drop it all the way down to uh, 0 0.1 milliseconds. Um, again, the default is one that tends to work pretty well. The release is just that after the gate, after your, the, the sound has ended, that's the time it takes to close the gate. And then the hold time is after you've adjusted that attack, you're now the gate is open, how long it kind of stays open before it releases, before it closes, all right? And this you sometimes have to adjust a little bit just to make it sound a bit more natural because you don't want it to sound like especially if there's a lot of room tone, kind of like a, you know, you don't want to hear some kind of weird, weird effect of, you know, manipulating that background noise. If it's held a little bit and then released gently, it just tends to sound a bit more natural and a bit more musical, for lack of a better word. So let's go ahead and play this back. And I'm going to adjust the threshold here and uh, take a quick listen to what we get. All right, here we go. The one thing I miss about my younger days when I was living in the and Folks didn't have money, but everybody seemed to live in a house with a porch. Is you could just go around and find folks who did what you did, you know, talk about stuff that you cared about. And uh, this site sort of does that. It's, I, to be honest, it's not the same as sitting on a porch with old friends and playing, but it's close. And it's like the technological version of that. All right. And can you hear now how quiet and clean in between those bits? Now here, if you're in headphones or on uh, uh, on nice speakers, let's turn the gate off and take a quick listen again. Sitting on a porch with old friends and playing, but it's close. 
It's like the technological version of that. All right, and here it is with the gate on, wind back to the same position. To be honest, it's not the same as sitting on a porch with old friends and playing, but it's close. And it's like the technological version of that. Now you can hear there's a little bit of breath at the end there. Friends and playing, but it's close. And it's like the technological version of that. Now that was actually me interviewing him going, <sighs> like I was laughing. So to bring it back in, I just dropped the threshold by another 2 dB or so. Basically, it sounds really nice and clean. And you'll notice again that that window stays open just long enough when he's kind of pausing so that it still sounds natural. Um, but again, in between those spoken sections, totally clean, totally awesome. Let's take a listen here. Stories, tell stories. Uh, I guess I'm just an old storyteller, guitar player, singer, songwriter, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Real nice. And you can hear there's like a little bit of rustle there. So what we might do for something like that little rustle is uh, a rustling of paper or whatever it is. Come on to the track here. In an audition, we have these non-destructive fade handles. And here's where you can just kind of just do a very nice little fade out right there. Let's just play back from here. Singer, songwriter, I suppose. Okay, I missed some of his speech right there. Singer, songwriter, I suppose. And we got rid of that little sort of rustling. Here it is with the rustling. Take a listen. I suppose. Yeah. All right. It sounds like I was like moving papers or something. Writer, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Now, again, we could have adjusted the threshold up. Probably if we went back to around minus 40, uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have caught that in any case. So there's a combination of different ways to do this. Just trying to evidence to you, showcase to you that the auto gate is really wonderful for just keeping the dialogue tight and clean, all right? The room tone doesn't bother me. Someone might say, well, why not denoise that? The room tone is nice. I don't, I don't, I don't need to. And I, I, I'd like to emphasize that, again, with the music underneath it, you're not gonna hear that anymore. The, the program material is loud enough where we don't have to worry about that. But if you wanted to denoise, you can do that as well. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about that just a little bit later. Okay, so now if there were one other thing that I wanted to do on here, and just because we're in the dynamics effect, it might be to use the actual compressor. Now, again, last week in part one, I talked about using um, essential sound with the dialogue uh, track selected, and then using the clarity slider, which uses our dynamics processor. Same thing, same concept, it's just a single slider to, uh, to allow you to add compression and kind of level out dynamics and bring a bit more focus to that voiceover. Totally legit, totally can do that, no reason not to. Just wanna showcase here that if you wanna use a more traditional compressor with traditional uh, settings, threshold, ratio, attack, release, and then your makeup gain, you can also do that here as well. It's got some pretty decent gain reduction metering here. So if I just wanted to simply enable a little bit of compression here, let's do that and then I'll show you quickly the split out of the tracks. Now, one thing that you wanna keep in mind about these settings, again, threshold is the point at which compression begins. The audio must cross that threshold to be able to, for, for anything to be able to be happening inside the compressor. Now, once it crosses that threshold, that's where we get to the ratio. And the ratio, uh, and this one, I wish it actually displayed the ratio, Typically, you'll see that displayed as X colon one. So like three to one or five to one or two to one. And what that ratio means is that for every two decibels above the threshold, it's one dB at the output. So let's say if he crosses our minus 20 threshold and his audio is hitting minus 18 with a two to one ratio, that would mean that the output, what you're hearing back is actually minus 19, okay? If he were to hit minus 16, right, four decibels above that threshold with a two to one ratio, that would mean that the output is minus 18. You get the idea. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple math there. Now, what are ratios? Well, smaller ratios will obviously tame dynamics less aggressively. Higher ratios will are intended to tame sort of really sort of crazy dynamic range changes more aggressively. It's considered compression when your ratio is below 10 to one. Okay, this is a standard audio practice. When ratios go above 10 to one, now it's considered limiting. 
So just real quickly, if I wanted to add compression manually here, typically for something like this, because he's fairly even, so there's not a lot of dynamic jumps, I probably wouldn't go any higher than about three to one. Your attack time, similar to the gate, how quickly the compressor kicks in, the release time after the signal falls below the threshold, how quickly it goes back to normal, how it releases that compression. And then oftentimes when you compress, as we just talked about moments ago, it's going to drop the overall amplitude. So the makeup gain does that. It allows you to make up, after you compress something down, it allows you to bring the overall volume back up. And basically, when you enable or disable the compressor, a way to know that you're doing it right is your sound, your overall loudness, should be about the same with the compressor on or off. That's how you know that you've adjusted makeup gain and your threshold and ratio accordingly. Now you can also use makeup gain to give it more amplification. Compressors by nature are also amplifiers. So, um, and I apologize for taking a lot of time on this, but this is one of those fundamental things that most people get wrong real easily. Um, just because it's kind of confusing, right? And not super intuitive. So again, I'm gonna take a quick listen here. I'm gonna adjust that threshold. Uh, when I see this gain reduction meter showcasing me at least three decibels, right? We have to be exceeding at least three decibels above this, this threshold for this to kick in. I'll know that it's working and then we'll adjust our makeup uh, gain accordingly. Incidentally, uh, for this, a one millisecond attack might be a little too, a little too fast. Typically for calm, easy voiceover, I'll use anywhere from three to 12 milliseconds and nine is kind of generally my sweet spot. Um, we'll see how that sounds. We may drop it down a bit. Actually, maybe we'll start at around three. Let's start at around three. Um, that's typically what you need for something like that. And then release, uh, just depends. Uh, 50 milliseconds is super fast. Maybe we'll make this around a hundred or so. All right. And let's take a quick listen. Here we go. I think it's very cool. Um, the one thing I miss about my younger days when I was living in Tennessee and folks didn't have money, but everybody seemed to live in a house. Okay, so you can hear super compressed right you now. Too much. You go around and find folks who did what you did, you know, talk about stuff that you cared about and. Um, this site sort of does that. It's I to be honest, it's not the same as sitting on a porch with old friends and playing, but it's close. And it's like the technological version of that. Okay, so did you hear? I adjusted the makeup gain. You can see here to around three point eight dB, because after we compressed it down, all right, and our threshold, we're probably we're doing about three to six dB of gain reduction. So that means that we're exceeding that minus 30 by about six or seven dB at the, at, you know, at the loudest portions there. Um, I needed to make up about four decibels of gain. So when I was turning on or off the compressor, I was able to hear it should be about that same volume. Now, if I wanted to just give this more overall boost, I can use the makeup gain for that as well. Okay, so this is sounding pretty good to me. I like the way this is sounding. So at this point now, Let's talk about ducking it against the music. So what we're going to do, just as before, um, just because I think it's a good habit and a good practice, when if you're going to be using essential sound, one good idea is to, again, tag and assign an audio type to your different, your different audio uh, clips. So I've got all the dialogue contained here on this iPhone track. So I selected all of those clips, and I tell essential sound, they are dialogue. Now, again, I have the option here to auto match. We talked about that last week. Here's clarity. So again, this is adding dynamic compression. If I wanted to do that there, I could do that. All I'm really doing at this point, though, is just telling Essential Sound that those are dialogue. And you'll see why in just a second. Because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to the music track here. I'm going to tell Essential Sound this is music. So when I select music, now, similarly, this gives me a series of different effects and filters and things that I would typically do uh, when mixing music. So we've got our loudness auto matching. Now I want to point out again how essential this is, not only for dialogue, right, to make all of your dialogues the same apparent loudness, but also for music. Because depending upon the type of music that you have in your scene, right here we've got, this is some of Fuzzy's and mine, acoustic blues. You know, an acoustic blues track may have a different overall loudness compared to, you know, an alternative rock track or compared to, you know, a pop sort of, you know, hip hop R&B track compared to a classical track. So loudness auto matching when used on music 
in a single click sort of levels everything. So they're all kind of at that same starting loudness. They all have that same apparent loudness. It's a single click and it just it just takes away a lot of that pain of having to keyframe and draw envelopes on all your music tracks. So that's something to consider. We've only got one here, so we won't use auto match. Duration we're gonna get to because that's audition remix. But first we're going to start with ducking. Because again, what we need to do is we need to drop that music every time he starts talking. And you can do this in Audition with a traditional function known as sidechain ducking. This is a bit more complex. To be honest, most people are never going to do that here, and I'll show you the manual way after. But this is, this is such a great new addition to Essential Sound, and it just works really brilliantly. So what we're going to do is we're going to enable the ducking feature. And what you notice real quickly, oh, it already finished. It quickly analyzes your track's audio. Now, real quick, I'm just going to, I'm gonna recolor this, because can you see? I don't know if you can see that. There's not enough contrast on here. Here, let me see. Uh, maybe this one will work better. Yeah, that's better, okay. So by enabling auto duck, what it does, or what it did, I should say, is you can see this little dotted line right here, so this is, this is basically a virtual keyframed volume envelope. And whenever he's talking, it drops that down, okay? And then when he stops talking, it raises it back up again, okay? And based on your settings here, this works dynamically. So you'll notice the first settings that you have up at the top here are duck against. And you could duck, duck against dialogue, music clips, Sound effects, ambience, those are the four known audio types to essential sound. Or if you brought this in, like, had I not done anything with the dialogue, had I not tagged them, we have this option here, duck against clips without an assigned audio type. So what that means to you is that you can use this function, even if you're importing an OMF or something else or a Final Cut XML, and you want to use this feature or do your audio post here in Audition, you don't have to have everything tagged. Ducking, the auto duck will actually allow you to duck music or whatever against files that don't even have an audio type. So that's really nice. And then you've got three basic settings here. Your first is sensitivity. And you can see your sensitivity is, no surprise, that's your threshold, right? The point at which to start ducking this clip against the other clips. The amount of reduction is just that, how much it drops it down. And then the fade here, you can see it's a look ahead time that defines how long the ducking starts before, again, it starts to bring, you know, duck the signal and then bring that music back up, right? So three simple settings here. So if we start, let's just kind of take a listen. And let's just start our playback around here. Down Since you said well. Oh, and you know what? I just realized there, this wasn't assigned. Notice here, it wasn't ducking on that clip. Somehow I missed that clip when I selected all the dialogue. So now I turn it into dialogue and look what just happened. Oh, 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 wait a minute. It dynamically adjusts? Yeah. So what that means, by the way, is if I move clips around, now this wouldn't work if you're actually synchronizing to video, of course, because then you're losing the sync. But let's say you're doing, it's voiceover, right? It's for a commercial. So you've got video and premiere, you've got commercial, dialogue, voiceover. You don't have an on-camera face. If you move clips around, so let me just show you here. Let me just move this. What you'll actually see is that it reconfigures the curve. Let me undo it. Watch how it's going to redraw that dynamically. Pretty cool, right? So this is totally, totally dynamic, totally real-time. Um, it's pretty amazing, and it does a pretty awesome job. So I think around an 18 dB reduction is going to be a little too much. Let's make it around minus 13. Let's wind back, and let's take a listen and see what we've got. Here we go. My name is Fuzzy Island, and uh, I play music, I write music, I write stories, tell stories. Uh, I guess I'm just an old storyteller, guitar player, Singer songwriter. I'm so damn Since you said well. I think it's very cool. The one thing I miss about my younger days when I was living in Tennessee. All right. And check this. Now, again, he's got all these sections here. You can see it visually where he's not talking. 
But based on the sensitivity here, the algorithm is smart enough. You know, it does, you can make it if you if you make it super low uh, sensitivity, it'll start bringing the music back in all those sections. You don't want that. So again, based on our setting here, which you'll see update dynamically, it leaves that music ducked even when he's pausing because it senses there's enough signal there. We should keep the music ducked underneath. It's that simple. It's so cool. Now, again, if that was a little too much reduction, uh, maybe the music should be even louder, right? We can we can say, okay, no, maybe maybe minus ten. And if that fade was maybe a little too slow, or maybe we want it to be a little bit longer or a little bit faster, let's try a little bit faster at around right around seven hundred. Okay, and uh, let's take a listen here. We'll go to a different section that we haven't heard before. Let's go to something like this over here. And as far as writing, whatever I hear in my head, I just sort of put it down. In a lot of ways, it doesn't seem to end because you're a musician, you know, you do stuff differently every time you do it. Okay, super cool. There's nothing more to say about this. It's that easy. It's that simple. Uh, you've got three basic sliders. Now, the next question, of course, that people always want to ask is, ah, but what if I've got some problem section and as I'm adjusting sensitivity, it's just, it's not cutting it, right? Or it's like, it's too sensitive. It's just, it's messing things up. It's not sounding right. Um, can I manually make adjustments? Yes, you can. So here we have this option here to monitor clip changes. That's what is dynamically redrawing the fade curve there. Okay. By the way, you notice the amount of decibels that you're reducing by is reflected in the, in the, uh, the uh, keyframed envelope down below as well. So that would be 28. That's way too quiet. All right. So if you uncheck monitor clip changes, now this becomes a keyframed envelope. So you can say, okay, you know what? For this bit, I want to like smooth it up. Or this one, I want it to drop down significantly. Or I need to add a couple more points and bring the music back in here and then fade it out here, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So it's fully editable. So good. And you'll see if you make changes to that now, of course, because you're in this manual mode, you'll probably want to reanalyze if you wanted it to go back into an auto mode. But either way, so cool, such a lovely addition to Essential Sound. And this is only available to you um, whoops, in Audition currently. Now that we've done that, let's shift gears a little bit here and talk about something that was asked just moments ago about splitting audio files into two separate mono clips. A lot of times your camera, you know, you'll have like a lav and a boom or a lav and ambient, whatever. And when you bring it in, it comes in as a stereo file, but you don't want it stereo because really it's dual channel mono, right? It's one separate signal in mono on the left side or channel one and another separate signal on the right side, channel two, that shouldn't be, you know, we're not trying to make, <laughs> if anyone listens to any music from the early sixties, you know, early Beatles are a good example, early who, early doors, you know, the band is over here. The voices are over here. You know, that was cool when two speakers were new and it's like, ooh, two. That sucks in video production. We don't want like the, 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 the lav mic here and then the ambient mic over here. It just sounds weird. You know, ultimately we'll do something in the center and then maybe do a slight adjustment of pan. So how do you then separate those two channels into two separate files? Well, on the audition side, if you go up to the edit menu, you'll see that we have extract channels to mono files. So when you do that, and you can see here this one anytime extracted, you select that. Now if we look down below in our files panel, let me scroll up a little so you can see that better. What you'll see is it took that mix and it's denoted by an L and R. So we know that that was the left channel or again effectively channel one and the right was channel two. Okay. Real simple. But in any case, as mentioned, we could create some mono audio tracks here. All right. My faders are now jumping into position because I'm adding new tracks and it goes into unity at zero. And I could take the left side here and drop that in and take the right side and drop that in. And then again, at this point now, I've got independent pan control and volume control of both channels. So if this was your lab and this was your ambience, you know, typically, you probably keep the lab in the center and maybe offset the ambience by 10 or 15% just to give it a little width or, or depth, a little more dimension. 
of course, you will naturally attenuate the amplitude of both of those as well. You know, that's a definite thing you'll want to do. But you get the idea. Okay, so let's go ahead and mute these. We don't need these up here anymore. Now, by the way, since you asked that as well, um, if we were to take something uh, here in Audition, you'll notice that the same function, so this is again a, a, stereo, um, a stereo mix here, the same function can be applied on the Premiere Pro side under the clip menu, audio options, breakout to mono. So same concept here. It'll take that dual channel mono stereo file and just separate channel one, channel two as, as discrete mono files. Um, up under edit, convert sample type. This allows you to do that. Now this is actually one of our most powerful features. This is one of the things that if you're going to do any kind of sample rate conversion, now I say this again, whether you're working in video, uh, whether you're just doing audio, you will want to do these conversions on the audition side. This is a very transparent sample converter, meaning that whether you're going, you know, converting up from say 44, 1, 44,100, which is your music and CD and Spotify standard, and you want to go to the video standard 48K, or maybe you're going to, again, sort of recording studio 96K, going up or going down, so 48 to 41, 96 to 48, or perhaps from 32-bit to 16 for final delivery, or 16 to 24, or 32 to 24, this is just going to give you a very seamless, transparent conversion. And I recommend doing this if you're going to do any kind of file conversion, even going to something like MP3 or even going from MP3 to Wave. I'd recommend doing it here before going into Premiere. It's going to be cleaner. We have more dithering options, which is effectively when you're adjusting bit depth, what it does when you're going down, for instance, from 32 to 16 or 24 to 16, what it does with all that extra information. You want to take advantage of what we have here in Audition. So if I wanted to convert this stereo file into mono, you'll see under channels here, I could say same as source, or I could say turn it into mono, okay? And then you can adjust how much of it do you want from the left mix and how much of it do you want from the right mix. Now this being the same thing in both channels anyway, 50-50, uh, this file's 32-bit float, so I'd keep it same as source in this case. I'm not trying to convert the, the bit depth here, all right? And then you see there's no dithering applied because it's not changing the bit depth. Uh, if I wanted to go to a straight 24-bit, I have someone who's working in Pro Tools and they want 24-bit files, you can do that here. Always enable dithering if you're adjusting bit depth going from 24 or 32 down. Always use dithering. There's no reason really not to. Um, one of the things that I don't use so much anymore is noise shaping. And that's a whole other conversation that we won't get into now, but um, your defaults of Dithering being enabled, using the triangular dither type, highly recommended. Again, I could spend a whole episode talking about what triangular sounds like versus Gaussian here. Um, the key there is transparent. If you convert something, it should sound the same, whether it's higher bit depth, lower bit depth, higher uh, sample rate, lower sample rate. Obviously, with sample rate, though, things will change quite radically if you go from 96K to 11K. It's not going to sound the same. That's not the algorithm. That's just because you've thrown away an enormous amount of frequency information. Okay, so that's converting sample type. All right, so back here in Audition, let's get rid of those mono. Actually, I can just leave them. They're muted anyway. Uh, we were talking about the ability to dynamically recompose music via Adobe Audition Remix. This is yet again another function um, of, uh, of the Essential Sound Panel. So for this... In this case, what we want to do is we want to take this music file. Let's just hold on. I'm going to see. Do I have some handles on this? I didn't make any handles on this one. Okay. So you can see that this one is just, it's just a little bit too long. Okay. We need to shrink it down. Now you've got a couple of options and ways to do that. So here in Audition, we also have what's known as, and if you toggle up at the, at the top here, we have something called global clip stretching. Now, this little white rectangle that you see in the corner here, if you simply click and drag that, that will do just that. It'll take your entire audio file as it is, okay? And if we just solo this, and you can see it'll actually perform what's known as kind of a, a real-time time stretch, where it's just going to fit all of that into that shorter amount of time without changing pitch 
Uh, but of course, the tempo will change. It's going to likely be faster. All right, if we ever play this back now. Okay, now that's a pretty aggressive stretch. It also sounds a little warbly. Um, it is using the real time um, algorithm. So if you want better sounding, better quality, we have the rendered version. And that basically does a sort of quick ish background uh, render there for better quality stretching. Also, I'd probably choose this, uh, set this to polyphonic as well, not monophonic. Here's the thing though. Um, that doesn't always sound very good. And if you need to adjust something by like a second, and again, we're talking about four minutes, so if we got to crunch it down five, 10 seconds, which is a very small percentage, yeah, okay, that's probably going to be somewhat inaudible, and you won't really incur any audio artifacting. What about, however, if you could simply take that music track and instead of stretching it, you could actually tell Audition to look at the file and look for places where it could cut out a section and automatically edit it for you and dynamically recompose it to fit the length that you actually want. Well, this is what it does when you use the remix method. So when I turn on remix, much like with our ducking, you'll see that it begins analyzing the clip. All right, done with that. And you can see you now have your target. So instead of 359.07, I want this to be 352.08. Now this is a pretty small change right here. So let's just make it 352, 352.10, okay? I'm gonna change the time. And what you now see is it performed an edit. Actually, this looks like the talking at the end. So it probably cross-faded in the middle of some silence. <laughs> You'd never even hear that. Um, but it, this little wiggly line represents an edited section. Now, I'm gonna go a little more extreme here. And let's take this down to something that would be a bit more realistic. I, I was hoping I had uh, the longer version of this, and I don't. So let's instead make this three minutes and 10 seconds, okay? So we're cutting out like 40 some seconds of music there. When I do that now, again, it analyzes and it looks for a logical place to perform an edit. So when I wind this back now and hit play, let's take a listen and see if we can hear it. Now here's the key. It doesn't change the tempo of the song. It doesn't change the pitch of the song. It has just basically recomposed the song form based on finding the best section that it could edit and crossfade together. Take a quick listen, here we go. Back for you. Listen again. You say you won't. Now, what's amazing is right there, it should be going anytime you're feeling lonely. And it cut it to another part of the verse and it's freaking seamless. What? What? How can that be? Let's go even more extreme. Let's cut this down to like two minutes. I'm trying to do weird sort of numbers so that it doesn't, I want to see more edits, okay? Got a couple more in there. We can even tell it to favor shorter segments. Now you'll see we've got three edits implemented in here. All right? So let's take a listen to these and hear what they sound like. Anytime, I'll be thinking of you. All right, back over here. Let's take a listen to this one. Nice, it edited in my bass solo there, okay. It's getting a little too long anyway, and let's take a listen to this one. I have to listen to that again. <laughs> this will shock you. This feature, much like if you've ever used, you know, content to wear fill, content to wear patch, all those photos, uh, functions in Photoshop that are true Adobe magic, you know, when they work, you're like, how is this, what? What voodoo magic is happening? This is one of those. Now, having said that, it's not gonna do everything all the time. You know, uh, sometimes you have to tweak it a bit more. And if you need to tweak it a bit more, I'm just gonna pull the properties panel up here 
so you can see this a little bit better. Actually, here, you know what? I'll, I'll place it above essential sound. I'll place it right here. All right. So let's twirl down remix up here. And you can actually see that you've got additional, uh, additional options. So first and foremost, you could adjust the edit length. So again, we're favoring shorter edits, if you'll recall. If we wanted to make sort of longer form edits, we can adjust that and you can see it dynamically readjusts accordingly. You also have the ability here to feature more of the, and I think there's a tooltip on this one here. Yep. So focus more on the timbral nature or the harmonic characteristics of the sound. Okay. Want to go more sort of on harmonic, drag this up a little bit more. Again, it kind of composes accordingly there. The minimum loop. Now, if you're using this on something that actually has a pulse, based on its analysis, um, this is going to say, okay, I don't want an edit to occur unless the audio is at a minimum of eight beats long. And in standard, standard, you know, I say standard music, most of the music that we listen to today, you know, that's non, non-classical, non-jazz, let's just put it that way, uh, non, non-speed metal, because those can have some pretty, or, or progressive rock. <laughs> Most music is what's known as 4-4 four, four time, four beats to the bar. You might have heard a phrase four to the floor. So one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. So that would mean eight beats, roughly two bars worth of music. At a minimum, I don't want to see an edit that's anything less than that. And that's just kind of a good practice because if it's too, if the edits are too short, it can start doing really weird things. You can also elongate this and say, I want it, you know, a minimum of 16 beats. And again, it'll adjust accordingly. Here, it's fine. You can see it's it's doing small edits anyway. And then the slack. So this, you can see, it determines the amount of time that basically Remix kind of gives at the, at the sort of top and tail here. Now, you have the option to stretch to an exact duration, okay? But then it's going to leverage a little bit of that dynamic time stretching um, algorithm that we heard before. If you're kind of already in position with that, okay. All right, You're, you, you, should be, you should be fairly good to go. I don't typically use this because I'll often just set a smaller target duration to account for slack at the beginning and the end, all right? That's just me. You can, again, play around with this. A lot of different sounds, a lot of different options. Let's just check out these edits here. I mean, that is just amazingly seamless. Okay, now that one, the edit was okay, but musically it wasn't quite in the right place for me. So I might again retweak some of the lengths here. And that was actually, I think we saw that edit when I changed the harmonic structure here. Yeah. So kind of move that back towards timbre, get a better edit over here. All right, back to the bass solo, another one here. God, that one's amazing, right in the bass solo again. Incredible. All right. Now, the last thing, of course, much like the auto duck, someone might say, ah, but what if I then want to take those pieces and kind of remix it myself? See, the amazing thing with this, like if we do really short segments uh, and we remix this down, let's just say to like two minutes or something. What's really cool is that now if you right click on the clip and go to remix, you will see, zoom in so you can see it here, you have the option to split remixed clip into segments. Yes, so much like what we just experienced in the auto duck where we can adjust the keyframe, adjust the curve of the ducking. When you choose split remixed clip into segments, now you can actually see not only where it's applied that crossfade, but that crossfade becomes editable to you, all right? And if you use any of our new uh, keyboard shortcuts, if you look down here, you can see by holding Alt, it'll apply a symmetrical fade. Now, again, this is typically what you'll want for this because you want it to be seamless um, when you're remixing music. With dialogue and things, you might, again, this is where you can use some of our additional modifiers. Hold Command, key to change the fade shape. Uh, hold the Shift key. Sorry, I lost my tooltip there. To fix either fade, duration, or shape. And it'll constrain different parameters there based on what you hold down. But this is again where you can just change or modify. And as you can see here, I can change uh, 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 you know, duration here. Again, holding down different modifiers. 
you know, adjust things accordingly. So you have all this flexibility now with adjusting your crossfade and your clips. By the way, when they come in like this, you'll see that they're grouped. So if you actually want to pull apart where it made those cuts, those cross, those cut sections, just uncheck, uncheck, uncheck group clips. And now if I zoom this back out, okay, all these pieces, sorry, undeselect there, all these pieces can be moved around. So though there's the edits. Look, it has this one little tiny edit because I said favor super short edits. So this is what we're talking about. Now this is obviously at a minimum of 16 beats here, but uh, based on the tempo, but now you have all these sections that you can drag around and use independently. All right. So pretty cool with Adobe Audition Remix. And uh, it's one of those things that, you know, if you if you struggle with audio editing, especially when it comes to music and today's music is that much more challenging because you can see even this clip now, because it's fairly minimal instrumentation, <laughs> this is pretty easy to cut against. You can really see where the attack transients are, right? Sorry, that was very loud because you're hearing it in the waveform editor here. Um, very easy to see kind of where things are on the beat. But if we go to like, you know, a more commercial, you know, again, sort of, you know, name any modern, you know, Taylor Swift recording or something, it's just going to be that kind of solid brick. It's very hard to see where transients are, meaning that it's going to be that much harder for you to visually identify where to cut things if you're not a seasoned audio editor. So Remix, it does the work for you. It, you know, it knows, it knows how to detect where those attack transients are, where the kick of the kick drum is. And that's the other thing too. Any kind of electronic dance music, when you use Remix, it's shocking how good it is because again, when things are beat based, this is so rock solid, it's so rock solid. So I highly invite you to check that out. All right, so quick, quick overview here of a couple of things that you can use for analysis just to help you understand what's going on with your audio. This panel, I talk about this. Um, again, if you're watching Audio 101 or get a chance to watch some of my Audio 101, you'll hear me talk about this panel a lot. And it is called Amplitude Statistics. You can find this under the window menu. This is something that I will run on every file that I bring into Audition from Premiere or anywhere because it's going to tell you everything you need to know. So if I go ahead and click Scan here. Now again, this is already mastered music, so at this point, I'm kind of, you know, just kind of looking to see if there's any clipped samples around. We just attenuated this, so we're going to be fine anyway. But the key is that this is literally showing you everything you need to know. I'm just going to bring it all up on screen so you can see it there about your audio, including the peak amplitude. Okay. So everything, the absolute peak here is minus six. All right. True peak, which is related directly to our new loudness measurement scale. So loudness units relative to full scale, also known as LUFS. Um, sample values, again, for the ultra audio nerds out there, possibly clipped samples. If you see clipped samples, you see this all the time when you get dialogue. In fact, I'll check. We'll take a look at my, um, one of the, uh, dialogue clips here. All right. One of our pieces dialogue. Okay. No clipped samples there. It's all pretty legit. Um, fairly, uh, non-dynamic dialogue, but very common to get dialogue and things that are, you know, have like momentary clipped samples or something like that. And that's an easy way to fix them or the opposite problem. So this is like the camera dialogue, I think. Charge and chances are with all the people out there who look. Yeah. So if you're like listening back, you're like, why is this so quiet? Well, because whether you were looking at your meters or not, this tells you that the actual peak amplitude of this is minus 26, right? Super, super quiet. Also measured bit depth, it's 16 bit. Why? Because this was the camera audio captured off of my um, Nikon D800, which is recording um, PCM audio, but at 16 bit resolution. So not that we'd use this anyway, because you can already hear even when it was that quiet, it was super echoey. But if I were to amplify this here, okay. Um, now you're gonna hear a lot of background noise, obviously. But now if I rerun the scan, this is again telling you exactly what we did. This also tells you that the way that that camera is capturing is dual mono. It's dual channel mono in a stereo container. How do we know? Because look at the attributes of the left and right channels. They're identical, okay? So a lot of these things, you know, stereo recording. Uh, yeah, it's dual channel mono, <laughs> which is fine coming off the camera. Now, 
you can plug in an external stereo mic, that's different. But usually your on-camera mics are, are recording in mono and just filling the left and right with the same. It's different, not for all, but usually filling the left and right with the same content. All right. Someone's so now something like this. Someone's stuff. Someone's this stuff. Some I don't know what that click was. It could have been me or maybe something on the camera. But it's those kinds of things where a lot of times that you might have a clipped sample or a peaked sample, and you might see the meters go red for a second, and you weren't you weren't thinking about it, but this actually lets you kind of go right to it and showcase exactly where those hot spots are. And you can see right here, this is actually showing me now exactly where the peak amplitude is. And actually it's here at this very sample. This is where we're hitting minus 1.7 right here, okay? And again, it's going across both of these. So um, in any case, Amplitude statistics, absolutely valuable, uh, showcasing to you not only, again, program loudness measured in LUFS, not only still all of our traditional RMS values, the actual bit depth of your files. Um, we don't worry too much about DC offset these days, but if you're taking sort of archive material, especially earlier digital archive material, you might encounter some of this. How do you repair things like DC offset, low frequency? rumble and imbalance and things that are just out of sort of poor poor recording technique you can fix that via the normalize function so under normalize again you have options here to normalize to a specific value in db or in percentage i never use percentage i'll always use db so you know if you want your dialogue to be at minus six we can do that and if there were any dc bias that needed adjusting here, we could say, okay, adjust that to 0%, apply that, and it does it automatically. Again, rescan the selection, look at our DC offset, and now it's zero. It was at 0 0.5, so, or 0.05. It wasn't anything audible in any case, but simple ways to kind of fix some of those problems. Additionally, if you had things like clipped samples, we also have via our diagnostics panel, something called the declipper. And this is a great way to uh, momentarily reduce clipped audio issues. So let's just real quickly here, I'm going to open up one example for you that has some clipped audio. Uh, this one. Okay. So just real quickly, this is from an interview that I shot. I use this example all the time, but it was real, and it showcases to you kind of the amazing capabilities of the declipper. Uh, here's a section where, again, on lav, uh, the speaker got a little excited. And when he got excited, he actually clipped the preamp that he was going into. And it gave us this kind of flatlined looking piece of audio right here. More importantly, though, you can actually hear this distortion. It's, and it's when he says the word actually, and you'll hear it kind of gets this crunchy sound. Take a quick listen. Filling in for Johnny Carson and actually interviewing the and then actually interviewing and then actually interviewing the Beatles. And then actually interviewing the Beatles. And here it just sounds a little crunchy. Here's another section where he says, on the couch. And couch has that little bit of distortion, a little crackly distortion. Uh, on the couch. Uh, on the couch. Uh, on the couch. Okay, so watch this. Here's some, here's some Adobe magic at play. We're going to go into declipper. Now you've got a couple of different settings here. You can do restore normal, restore lightly clipped, or heavily clipped. Now, the first thing that we typically will do is we're going to scan this. And it's going to tell you how many actual problems it found, okay? I will generally use the restore normal, but that often involves two steps. Sometimes after it restores those clipped peaks, you might then have to normalize or bring the audio down because once it restores some of those transients, they might actually live above that zero dB line. Now you're thinking to yourself digitally, how can it go above zero? Well, because we're working in 32-bit float, that floating point is actually what allows us, those additional bits up there allow for processing and post-processing and adding effects and things. So you can actually have audio that exceeds zero dB. You can't deliver it that way, but when we're processing, that's one of the amazing things that this allows you to do. When you choose Restore Lightly Clipped, that's automatically going to perform a little bit of an attenuation, but it's also going to restore those digitally clipped attack transients. So let's go ahead and choose Restore Lightly Clipped. Again, take a look at our flatlined piece of audio here. Repair all. Boom. And now, look at this. Remember, it was just flat, and now it actually has curve to it. 
so does the other one. And when we take a listen... Johnny Carson and actually interviewing the Beatles. Johnny Carson and actually interviewing the Beatles. All right, let's go to the other one, on the couch. Uh, on the couch. Uh, on the couch. Uh, on the couch. Right? Before... Carson and actually... And actually... And actually... And I want to point out, you can see it's not going above zero here, right? It's clipped inside the file via the preamp that it was being fed into. Similarly here, look at this. Look at this rectangular squared off thing happening right there, okay? Let's do redo the clipper, declipper again. Whoa. Look at that. Look at that. Carson, and actually interviewing the Beatles uh, on the couch. Okay. So once again, the D-Clipper, unbelievably invaluable resource for your video productions. You're doing voiceover, you've got ADR, you've got on-camera sound, you've got these momentary distorted clip sections. It's not going to fix everything. It's absolutely not going to fix everything. You have to just try it. It can amaze you. Generally, if you've got something that's clipped mm, 5 to 10-ish dB or so, it can usually restore that. And it only works for short attack transients. Okay, the difference being that a short attack would be something like, you know, actually, so it's that, that, uh, that initial, ah, right, that just caused this burst of air, this burst of sound to momentarily clip that input or clip the preamp or, or just distort via the capsule on the microphone. If you've got continuous music or audio that's just like, you know, super loud and clipped and distorted the whole time, this is not going to fix that. So it's always for those short momentary, like think of popping peas, plosives, or people get excitable and they get loud for a second. That's the kind of stuff that this can miraculously repair for you. So I highly invite you to check that out. And keep in mind that, of course, if this were sent from Premiere Pro, this project, which this one was, any changes that we make here, we save these back, we go back into our uh, multi-track here. And here's where we can say, okay, I want to send this all back to Premiere, but I want to keep editing with better sound. You've got a couple of different options, and here's where we're going to leave it for today. So under File Export, we can choose to, say, go to Multitrack Mix Down, and we could mix everything down into stereo. But then we have to re-import manually into Premiere. So if we choose to export to Adobe Premiere Pro, which you can also do from the Multitrack menu, what that now does is it says, okay, I want to export each track as a stem. So it will, in fact, render out all of the things that you've done. So the ducked music, right? The retimed, remixed music, the compressed and gated dialogue, all of that will be mixed down into stereo or mono stems, depending upon the track configuration, and will be imported automatically back into Premiere um, as individual stems. You also have the option, excuse me, to mix down to mono, stereo, or 5.1 if you were working in 5.1. Now, I've already moved things so this isn't exactly in sync anymore. But let's go ahead and do that. Let's actually send this back over to Premiere as stems just so you can see what it does. Let's go ahead and choose export here. All right, let it do its thing. Import the files, okay. Copy it to new audio tracks or you can say, you know, where do you want it to go? So yeah, new audio tracks like that, okay, expand this down here, and now when we take a look, all right, once again, you can see, you're going to mute this, right? Name's Fuzzy Island, and... Uh... So here's our original. Again, everything's still in sync, right? We didn't change the starting times of any of this, but uh, everything's beautifully in sync. Everything is uh, adjusted accordingly and everything is on its own track. And again, it took the same track names from Audition and placed them here. But now this iPhone dialogue track contains the gating and, uh, and the compression that we added. And you can actually see that because it looks very evened out, right? Before we had a couple of more ambient, uh, uh, rather dynamic peaks in there just momentary peaks. This now looks, it's not squashed, but it just looks that much more even because of that three to one compression ratio. I play music, I write music, I write stories, tell stories. Uh, I guess I'm just an old storyteller, guitar player, singer, songwriter, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. And again, you always have access to your original clips when you send a project from Audition, it's non-destructive. 
So all the original audio as it was is still accessible. These are new stems that it created for you that you can now leverage inside your timeline and continue to you know perform your edits and whatnot. And if you want to go back again, edit an audition sequence, or you can even send individual clips over to audition for modification and processing. And my friends, that does it for today's episode of uh, how to make good videos great with audio. So thank you so much for joining me. Have a great weekend wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.